Hello, welcome. Welcome back to Cuenca, Ecuador. Now, while we were here, just uh, for a few videos, we were here at the Museo Pumapungo, like two videos ago, and back through there behind the fountain, the entrance to the parks, El Parque con las Ruinas de Pumapungo, the ruins of Pumapungo, which we saw in a video as well. We were right next to this other building. That was the, uh, I thought, National Bank of Ecuador, because it said Banco Nacional de Ecuador on the front. It's this building right over here. And uh, turns out, there's actually a museum in there. It's uh, Museo de la Moneda, a currency museum, which actually sounds kind of interesting. Maybe a history of like uh, money and currency here in Ecuador. Probably get to see some like cool old um, like money presses and uh, coins and old money and stuff like that. So we're gonna go in and check it out. Let's go. Before we do that, I just want to say real quick thank you very much for watching the video. Click the like button and the subscribe button and leave a comment down below. It's free, it's easy, and it will help the channel grow and help this content reach other YouTube viewers. All right, back to the video. So we got in. The museum is free to enter. And it looks like it's kind of small, but looks pretty cool. The downstairs section is about the creation of the Central Bank of Ecuador. Here we go. El Banco Central de Ecuador se creó en el 10 de agosto de 1927. Created August 10th, 1927, during a period of social and economic instability, uh, market instability, and uh, internal crisis uh, that the uh, country was suffering. They have some money here. This is this is what I really wanted to see. I really like looking at old money. I don't know why. It's a very nerdy thing, but like, it's cool to see like these original bills, 1928, right? Because the the bank, central bank, was founded in 27. So then they minted minted these bills the next year. They're really cool, actually. Now, um, Ecuador, of course, now has dollarized. They no longer use uh, sucres. That was the the currency that they originally used when they mount, when they first started the central bank. Uh, they no longer use that; they use dollars. So if you go to an ATM here in Ecuador, you just get like twenty dollar bills out U.S. dollars. Um, and they still actually have, I've noticed, some like um, as far as like centavos, so cents, Ecuador centavos mixed in. Sometimes when you get change from a store or something like that, they'll give you maybe like a quarter. And, and a 50 cent, a US 50 cent piece, like a Kennedy um, half dollar, but they'll also give you like a 50 centavo piece. And since they've pegged any, you know, existing Ecuadorian currency that's in, in circulation, they've pegged it to the dollars and cents of the US, it basically is the same thing. And actually one thing that's really interesting is I've seen a lot of um, golden dollars, or they call them Sacagawea dollars, in uh, the United States because there's a on the front is Sacagawea and um, what's really interesting is like you see them here a lot you don't see them in the United States at all people in the United States don't really like coins but I've noticed in South America in a lot of countries they do and they have like larger denomination coins there's some old sucres 20 sucres they have these larger denomination coins like, for example, in, uh, in uh, Peru, where we just were, they have uh, soles is the currency. And three and a half, roughly, soles is one dollar. But they have, like, the largest coin that they have is a five sole coin. So that would be like having a coin that's like a dollar fifty coin, which in the United States they would not do. Um, but they do it around... They do it around here in South America. These are really cool. You can go around to both sides of these, cool, of course, so you can see like the front and the back. Very cool. These are 1988 sucres, more modern sucres. Now, Ecuador, they ended up dollarizing, I think, around the late 90s or the early 2000s uh, due to an inflation crisis here. The inflation was getting out of control 
and they uh, they dollarized, and they've been on the U.S. dollar ever since. They're one of, I think, like three countries in Latin America that have dollarized. I think it's uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Dominican Republic, maybe? I don't know. If I get that wrong, I'll put the right one in the down in the subtitle, I promise. It's actually a little more complicated than that. While those three countries, uh, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Panama, have officially dollarized, meaning the US dollar is their official uh, legal currency, there are other countries in Latin America that are sort of like semi-dollarized, unofficially dollarized, where the US dollar and the official currency, like the uh, peso or the solde in, in, or the sol in Peru, like they are, um, they're both sort of used as, as uh, legal tender. In Argentina, for example, where we were, people use the peso in like everyday transactions, like going to the store and buying groceries. But because it's uh, there's hyperinflation going on there and the peso is devaluing so quickly, people keep their savings um, for the most part in US dollars. This is like, you get some very large Sucre bills. As you can see, as you're getting closer, it was like 1988. This had to have been when they were getting close to, uh, the inflation was really getting out of control because you're having like thousand thousand sucre bills yeah these thousand sucre bills in 1980s over here also yeah thousand sucre bills these are in the 70s 60s and 70s, they already had 1,000 sucre bills because they had originally started off with 100 being, you know, the most. So inflation, you can see, if you go through, you can see how the inflation is increasing. But um, like I said, I don't think it got really out of control until like the late 90s and the, uh, the early 2000s. I don't know exactly the date when they decided to dollarize when that happened. I'll put it in the subtitle, of course. Looks like there's a replica of a vault here, which we can go in. Oh, there's a little video explaining some stuff. It's all in Spanish, so, well, we're not gonna watch the whole thing, but. Here are all the provinces, I think. Yeah, all the provinces. There's us, Azue province. Azue, that's where we are. And of course, you can see the province to the north is called Cañar, right? The Cañari civilization, which we've talked about in previous videos. Anyway, these are all the different provinces, provinces of uh, Ecuador. These look like old adding machines. Oh, muchas gracias. Looks like there's some, oh, here, some old, different money from different countries. Here, here are the soles from Peru that we were talking about. Soles. They used to have the 10 sole coins. Of course, now, like I said, the soles, the largest one they have is a five sole coin, but. Great British pounds. Ecuador condor coins. Oh, used to be called condors. Lira in Italy. That's the old Italian money. Now they use the euro. French francs. Oh yeah, look at this. Here are the old Sucre coins. And reales. Sucres and centavos. And more sucres and centavos. See these 50 centavo coins, they're small. Now it's interesting, like I said, they sort of use 50 centavo coins still. And uh, that's been pegged to the 
to the American currency, to the U.S. currency. So the 50 centavo coins they have now are big. They're big just like the American um, half dollar coins. They're the same size. So I imagine they minted new coins, right? Because they would need them to be the same size so that you can tell really easily just by looking at it what its value is when it's mixed in with US coins. Oh yeah, so here. Yes, this is in the 90s. This is what I was mentioning, right? 1999, they had a 50,000 sucre bill. So this is when the, <laughs> the uh, inflation is getting kind of crazy in the late 90s. 50,000 sucres. We were actually in a country very recently in Argentina that is suffering right now, unfortunately, from a very serious inflation crisis. And the largest bill that they have is a 2,000 uh, peso bill. And you end up having to, um, you end up having to have a lot of bills <laughs> when you exchange, if you exchange dollars for pesos, you have a big stack of bills because uh, they don't have very high denominations. I think they were, there was talk of uh, them printing a 20,000 and a 50,000 going all the way up there to the, that size of a peso in Argentina. Don't know exactly what's happened there. I've actually since learned, since this video was filmed, in between the time it was filmed and the time that we're releasing it, that there's actually a 10,000 peso bill which has been minted and is now in circulation. They've also minted a 20,000 peso bill which they are going to, uh, I believe, release at the end of the year, like in December, out into public circulation. I learned this from uh, some articles that I read and also a friend of mine in Argentina confirmed it. If you want more um, information about the inflation and exchanging money in Argentina and things like that, I did a video about that actually. I'll put the link in the description. But my hope for Argentina, I really enjoyed visiting Argentina. And my hope is that the economy is headed in the right direction under their new president, um, Javier Milei. Did some videos about the presidential election because we arrived there right as the election was uh, was happening. I'll link those videos in the description as well if you want to watch them. Up here, this is like the history of currency. Going, going way back. Una escala de valor es un criterio que utilizamos para asignar el valor económico a las cosas. It's like a system to, or a criteria to assign value to things. So before you have an actual coin that has a set value, you still have things that you can sort of estimate the value. So you can trade them for things of like value. Cuerpo, poder y valor. Body, ability, and value? I don't know. I don't know if that's actually what that means. Sometimes in Spanish, just like in English, um, they use, you know, words have multiple meanings. Cuerpo might mean body, but it may mean something else in this context. It all has to do with context. And unfortunately, my Spanish is not good enough. I haven't been pra practicing enough recently, but I haven't learned enough to know every situation. Could probably study for another 10 years and still not learn enough. That's how languages are. Here we have some older sucres. These are from 1920, Banco Sur Americano. Okay, so this is before there was a central bank of Ecuador because it said down there that they uh, they created the bank in 1927. Let's see what this says. 1884, during the mandate of the president of Ecuador, Don Jose Maria Placido Camiano, took determination to establish a new official currency. 
denominated the Sucre. The initiative uh, responded to the necessity to forge an identity, a monetary identity, independent from the system of Spain, uh, the Spanish system at the time, que seguía la tendencia occidental de adoptar el system de mis decimal frances. Hmm, I don't know quite what that means. At the time, they continued a tendency to adopt the system, the French decimal system. I'm getting lost. <laughs> My Spanish, man, reading Spanish. I always start out so strong, and then I blow it. The new currency was divided into 100 centavos, and compartían tanto el peso como la composición de plata fina con el dolor estadounidense. So I guess they compared to the peso, which was composed of silver, fine silver. This was more like the US dollar, I guess. They used it and extended, uh, its use extended to the, all the transaction, commercial transactions in the territory of Ecuador. And uh, the name of the money was selected in honor of Mariscal Antonio Jose de Sucre, uh, a, a tras una pro, by, by a uh, propuesta of a deputy of the province of Azue, el padre Julio Matovele. Además, se destacó, se destacó, I don't know that word. Que el sistema multinero ecuatoriano. Okay, uh, I don't know what the last part means. It has something to do with the US dollar and the Spanish real. I think I did pretty good. Honestly, I don't usually stand and read Spanish like in videos like that, but I think I did pretty good on that sign, guys. Even on a bad Spanish day like today, my Spanish today has been real bad. I was at a cafe earlier today, and I just I could not understand at all what anybody was saying. I felt like an idiot. And these are the different banks, of course, here that have been and when they were founded, it looks like. And, uh, I mean, a lot of these, they're still like Banco, Banco del Pinchicha, or P, uh, Pichincha. That's still around. I see branches of that around. Some more sucres here from this is before the Central Bank of Ecuador was founded in 27, but they still had sucres because the sucres, like we read from that sign, were, uh, they started using sucres in like the late 1800s. These are really cool. Old money, very cool. La paja, toquilla, y la economía del sur of the 19th and 20th century. El sombrero de paja, toquilla, se lo leo el producto líder en la economía del sur. The hat, this specific type of hat, was uh, a product seat that... <laughs> My Spanish fails me. I'm not even going to try with that one. But this does look important. Look. I'll take a quick look. And I will pause the video and translate this. Future, future Gary will translate this for you. Because I'm sure it's actually quite important. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so basically it's saying that this specific type of hat was a major product of the economy here during like the 1800s and the 1900s. Um, they would import textiles from Peru in, around Lima and bring them up here and make these hats. And in the peak at the end of the 1800s, like around the turn of the century between 1800s and 1900s, they exported, um, you know, roughly 100,000 of these uh, mainly to Europe. Here is a comic, which I don't understand. Oh, here's an old painting. Two representations of uh, gold in the 19th century. The first is of the Conquista. It's down here. And this is, must be of how they mined gold and how they or maybe how they, uh, the oven that they used the, to, uh, to like melt the gold down so that they could cast gold coins, perhaps. Oh, this is, the, oh, this painting is the death of Atahualpa. Muerte de Atahualpa. Now we learned all about Atahualpa, or a decent amount about Atahualpa while we were in Peru. He was the last king of the Incas. He was held hostage for a ransom of a ton of gold. Like a, they, they, they described the amount of gold not in weight, but in volume, like a room full of a big room full of gold. You know, fill this room with gold, and we'll give you your king back. And uh, the Inca did fill the room with gold, and uh, they did not give the king back. They killed him. <laughs> they killed him anyway. Francisco Pizarro, the conquistador who uh, founded the city of Lima in Peru, where we were, and who also killed Atahualpa. I don't know if he did it himself, but, you know, he did, basically. Anyway, that's, that's a little dark. We're here to look at old money, not to think about the death of Atahualpa. De monedas. Globales a monedas locales. From global money, global currency to local currency. I mean, if you are interested actually in more about Peru and Lima and uh, Atahualpa, I'll link a description down in the. In the uh, or I'll link a video down in the description. Actually, I'll link the whole Peru playlist down in the description. How about that? Go check it out. We got a lot of Peru content. Good Peru content, honestly. We did a lot of stuff there. It was really fun. Quite enjoyed Lima, Peru. El Sur, la economía y la transacción a la república. From the 19th, 18th and 19th centuries. Old maps. Here's a newer map, actually. This is the uh, Republica de Colombia, Gran Colombia. So this is basically the uh, Gran Colombia that um, was formed, uh, you know, right after independence from the Spanish. Simon Bolivar, Venezuela. Um, Colombia and Ecuador were all part of it. Very, very interesting. Just like in the rest of South America, the videos that we've done about independence in like Chile and Argentina and places like that. 
very interesting story up here in the northern part of South America as well. The southern part was driven, you know, a lot of the history revolves around Jose de San Martin. He's like the man in that, in all of the, <laughs> the histories of uh, the liberation of South America. They, they refer to him as the liberator of Argentina, Chile, and Peru. And uh, we have a whole video about him. I'll link it in the description, of course. But up in the north, it was Simon Bolivar liberating Venezuela and Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador. Of course, he didn't just do it by himself. You don't want to fall, fall victim to great man history, as they say. There's plenty of other people involved, all the way down to, like, the foot soldier on the ground who was actually fighting the wars for independence but he's the one who gets in the history books he's the one who they name streets and parks and after and they put up statues to him and they put him on the money and stuff Simon Bolivar and Jose de San Martin guys like that still interesting history this looks like a fruit vendor and sort of agricultural representation of like a indigenous agricultural worker farmer an hombre guanero hombre guanero very interesting oh here's some here's another map of uh Ecuador sites distribution of salt in the 16th century. Oh wow, so that's like back in the 1500s. The salt trade, salt mining here, very important. Of course, you know, back then, pre-refrigeration, salt, extremely important. Extremely important mineral, very, very valuable for preserving food. There's Cuenca, right there. Further north, Rio Bamba and Ambato in the middle of the country. And then further north, there's Quito. That's the capital. You can see the big old port city of Guayaquil. The two largest cities in, um, in uh, Ecuador today are Guayaquil, down there, the port city, and the capital, Quito, up there. Billions of people in both of those cities. They're big cities. Cool, very cool. Old Corona de Quichua de Pluma. So Quichua crown of feathers. Looks like it's a replica though. Still cool. Still cool to see. I think that's about it for this museum. To see it, it was interesting. I think it was really interesting. And, uh, you know, honestly, we got on a few tangents during this video. If you've been watching my videos, you know that happens often. We go on tangents. My brain is just like a tangent machine. It heads off in every direction. So we talked about a lot of stuff that wasn't really related necessarily to this museum, but the museum was cool. It was very cool, and it's definitely worth seeing if you come here. It's free. Um, it's a very short, like, experience, but I think it's cool, and I think it's worth it. And especially if you're right here, coming to see the ruins of uh, Pumo Pongo, and you're coming to see the museum of Pumo Pongo, which I also highly recommend. Um, you know, like I said, we did two videos about those. Link's in the description. Come here and see this museum, too. Definitely. Definitely come check this out. All right, that's going to be it for the video. So stick around, and uh, we'll see you in the next video.